The instrumental use of the history of slavery today also underlies the claim that slavery grew out of racism. For most of its long history, which includes most of the history of the human race, slavery was largely not the enslavement of racially different people, for the simple reason that only in recent centuries has either the technology or the wealth existed to go to another continent to get slaves and transport them en masse across an ocean. People were enslaved because they were vulnerable, not because of how they looked. The peoples of the Balkans were enslaved by fellow Europeans, as well as by the peoples of the Middle East, for at least six centuries before the first African was brought to the Western Hemisphere. Before the modern era, by and large, Europeans enslaved other Europeans, Asians enslaved other Asians, Africans enslaved other Africans, and the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere enslaved other indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. Slavery was not based on race, much less on theories about race. Only relatively late in history did enslavement across racial lines occur on such a scale as to promote an ideology of racism that outlasted the institution of slavery itself. Wherever a separate people were enslaved, they were disdained or despised, whether they were different by country, religion, caste, race, or tribe. In East Africa, the Maasai were feared slave raiders, and other African tribes, either alone or in conjunction with Arabs, enslaved their more vulnerable neighbors. As late as 1891, it was reported that Manyuema slavers had demoralized surrounding tribes, destroying crops, and famine reigned everywhere. Even in the early 20th century, Abyssinians were still raiding other Africans and carrying off slaves. It was 1922 before the British had gained sufficient control in Tanganyika to stamp out slavery there. Arabs were the leading slave raiders in East Africa, ranging over an area larger than all of Europe. The total number of slaves exported from East Africa during the 19th century has been estimated to be at least 2 million. The form in which the story of slavery has reached most people today has been along the lines of the best-selling book and widely watched television miniseries Roots by Alex Haley. Challenged on the historical accuracy of Roots, Haley said, I tried to give my people a myth to live by. This instrumental use of history, or purported history, is open to the same objections as other instrumental myth-making. Despite the impression created by Roots, during the era of the massive slave trade from West Africa, a white man was more likely to catch malaria in Africa than to catch slaves himself. The average life expectancy of a white man in the interior of sub-Saharan Africa at that time was less than one year. By and large, men from Europe or the Western Hemisphere came to the coasts of Africa, bought their slaves, and left as soon as possible. Even so, the death rates among the white crews of the ships carrying slaves to the Western Hemisphere were as high as the death rates among the slaves themselves. It was only much later, after quinine and other medical measures enabled Europeans to survive where there were tropical diseases, was it possible for them to invade Africa in force and establish empires there. But by then, the Atlantic slave trade had already been ended. During the era of that trade, Africa was largely ruled by Africans, who established the conditions under which slave sales took place. The crew of a slave ship was in no position to defy African rulers and their armies by going out across the land and capturing people willy-nilly. The stronger African peoples captured and enslaved the weaker peoples. The same pattern found over the centuries in Europe, Asia, the Western Hemisphere, and Polynesia. In Yasa land, the Ngoni and Yao swaggered over and terrorized other tribes. In Uganda, the Baganda made life miserable for their neighbors. And the Nioro and Hima of Anko enslaved Toro women and children. The Tutsi dominated the Hutu in Rwanda. The Maasai lorded it over the Kikuyu and Kamba. And the latter, in turn, held the Indorobo in a kind of serfdom. It was precisely the fact that Europeans, except for the Portuguese, seldom participated in the raids that captured and enslaved Africans that enabled most people in Europe and the Americas to remain oblivious to the traumatic experience that this was, with some Africans committing suicide to avoid capture and wives being whipped as they tried to cling to their husbands or children. 
historian David Brian Davis pointed out that Europeans had little contact with the actual process of enslavement, and that as late as 1721, the Royal African Company asked its agents to investigate the modes of enslavement in the interior. Europeans typically saw only the end results, enslaved people being offered for sale on the coast. It was much the same story in the Ottoman Empire, where those who bought slaves had no idea what these slaves had been through before. The unique position of the Western world in the history, and especially the destruction of slavery, need not imply that there was unanimity within the West on this institution. In addition to whites who defended the enslavement of Africans on racial grounds, or who opposed general emancipation on social grounds, there were many whites, and even blacks, who defended slavery as a matter of self-interest as slave owners. Although most black owners of slaves in the United States were only nominal owners of members of their own families, there were thousands of other blacks in the antebellum South who were commercial slave owners, just like their white counterparts. An estimated one-third of the free persons of color in New Orleans were slave owners, and thousands of these slave owners volunteered to fight for the Confederacy during the Civil War. Black slave owners were even more common in the Caribbean. In short, there were many defenders of slavery in the West, even in the 19th century. And outside the West, slavery was too widely accepted to require defense. No other nation ended slavery in the same way as the United States did, and few ended it after so short a struggle, as history is measured. How and why did slavery end in most of the world? There were two major processes. Over the centuries, as more and more territories around the world consolidated into nation-states with their own armies and navies, raiding those territories to capture and enslave the people who lived within them became more hazardous in itself and also risked military retaliation against the countries from which the raiders came. Thus, more and more peoples became off-limits to slave raiders over time. Put differently, the areas which remained subject to slave raiding over the centuries were primarily those where the people lived in smaller or weaker societies. Such societies continued to exist where it was difficult, for geographic or other reasons, to consolidate large areas under one government. This was true of the Balkans, the backwaters of Asia, and much of Sub-Saharan Africa. By the early modern era, Sub-Saharan Africa, with its numerous and severe geographic handicaps, was one of the last remaining areas from which vast numbers of people could be enslaved 